as these individuals are coming in early into your company, you do need to incentivize them. And there's two ways that people do this, a discount or a cap. Um, a discount is exactly what it sounds like. So let's say you give a 20% discount to your on your safe agreement. And a year down the line, you raise an equity round of funding and each share is worth $10. Any new investors coming in, they're gonna have to pay $10 per share. But someone who had a safe agreement, their shares that they purchased way back when convert as if the price was only $8 per share. So if they had um, put in $64, then they would get eight shares. Um, whereas someone who's putting in $64 later on will only get 6.4 shares. So they basically get to, to say that what the money they put in already gets to convert at a discount in the future. Um, all, the other thing that people do is a cap. So let's say I give you $100 and in my head I'm like, okay, in a year when this converts, this company will be worth $1,000. So my $100 is worth 10% um, of the company. But it goes really, really well. And so a year from now, instead of being worth $1,000, your company is worth $100,000. So that person who put in $100 early thought they were buying around 10% of your company, and it turns out they were only buying 1% of your company. A cap kind of, kind of um, like reduces the risk of that happening. But because you, you can say, okay, even if my company is worth $100,000, you get to convert the money you put in at a maximum of the company being worth $50,000. So at worst, they're only getting 2% of your company, not just 1%. I know this is very technical, so if you have questions, please feel free to ask. But that safe agreements and convertible notes, they're the earliest stage instruments that people put into a startup. The other side is equity which means they're actually buying a piece of your company. When you're raising on a safe note or a convertible note or a safe agreement, you actually still own the entirety of your company. But when you sell equity, you're selling ownership of your company. At the point of selling equity, you have to know how much each share is worth. Um, and so it's mostly used in Series A or beyond. And equity typically comes with voting rights, um, or board seats or other elements of corporate control and governance. So someone who puts in money on a convertible note in your company should not get a seat on the board. But typically when you raise an equity round, the lead investor, that's the person who put in the most money and also the person who set the terms of the round, um, they typically join your board. Questions on safes, convertible notes and equity? Okay, so, you know, investors, they always say at the, like in the early stage, an investor is putting money in you as much as they're putting in your company. So there's mechanisms that they can use to make sure that you stick around. Um, so what do investors want? They want founders that each have at least like 10% ownership. Um, obviously the more founders that you have, the, fewer the smaller percent of equity that the company will have but if you're like oh meet dave he's my co-founder and he has 0 0.005 percent of the company well then most investors won't really think of dave as a co-founder and it would be easy for dave to go get another job that compensates him more jump ship and go to another startup shares are given out as options and what an option is basically is the option to purchase your shares at a later date for today's price. Um, I see a qu question. I couldn't get it clear with the convertible note. Um, and can equity be given out over a period of time based on an agreement? Okay, I'll come back to those two questions. So what an option is, is let's say you're an employee who joins the company at a super early stage and each share is only worth $1. Five years from now, uh, ShopRite decides to buy your food brand and turn it into a ShopRite brand. And now instead of each share being worth $1, each share is worth $10.
the employee who has the option to purchase the shares um, at one dollar, basically they get that spread, the nine dollar spread when the company sells. So they have to purchase their equity from the company. Let's say they have 10 shares that they got for one dollar each. So they purchase, there's 10 shares for $10 or 10 CD, and then ShopRite purchases it for them at 10 CD each. And so they get 90 CD as a spread between those two um, as their money. So that's the benefit of options because you assume that the valuation of the company is going to increase from today through to some exit event. And so the earlier you get to come into the company, the less money you have, your options are at, and so the more of the upside that you get when the company eventually um, sells. The options, you get to buy a certain number of shares, so it would be in your employee um, agreement with the company. Um, and they have um, a period over which they vest. So I'm not gonna say um, to Kwaku, here you go, here's the option to buy 10% of my company, and you have it today automatically. Um, because Kwaku might work for a month and then leave. And even if he chooses to leave or I fire him, same thing. Um, so why should he get, if the company sells, the option to buy up to 10% of the company? So typically there's a one year cliff. What that means is if that the employee's contract ends within that one year period, they get nothing. They have no options, no right to buy any share of your company. And their options vest over a four-year period, which is it's typical as a four-year vesting period, which means that if they get the opportunity to buy 100 shares, after one year, they have the opportunity to buy 25, after two, they have the opportunity to buy 50, and so on and so forth. So the, in order for them to get their entire options grant from the company, they have to stay there for at least four years. Now for the founders, a lot of times investors will come in in later stages and say, here's a lot more money, but I want you to reset your vesting, which means that you may have already been there for five years, so there's nothing really keeping you around in terms of options. So they'll say, we're resetting your vesting and now you're gonna vest over the next three years. That's also pretty typical. Um, so equity, can it be given out over a period of time based on agreement? That's basically what an option is. Um, you can also do options with investors and say, let's say it's a strategic investor. Let's keep using ShopRite as the example. And ShopRite puts some money in you and you say, okay, you know, if within one year our food product is distributed in every ShopRite nationwide, then you can purchase more of the company. Um, there's also things called pro rata agreements, which are um, agreements with your investors that say, Today at the early stage, you bought 10% of my company, and no matter how much the valuation is, how much other people wanna get into this investment round, you have the right to purchase as much equity as you can to keep it so that you always own at least 10% of the company. Um, so I couldn't get it clear with the convertible note. Whoever wrote that question, can you give me a little bit more detail as to what is unclear? And in the meantime, I'll keep going. Um, so this is now, this map's a little bit old, but I put the link in the top. You can always go to their website and they're updating um, the maps all the time. Um, but this is a good way to kind of understand who invests in your market, which kind of investors are around. The landscape is changing very, very rapidly. Um, like most investment funds in Africa, especially in, in West Africa, they're mostly Nigeria-based, and they've mostly been started in the last five years. Um, but you can see in Ghana, uh, we're doing better than some other countries, but at this point, there were you know, five um, funds that were investing, and Golden Palm and Chanzo are both later stage funds. Um, so if you wanted seed capital, you're looking at Mass 4DX, and I can't see what that one is. Um, as opposed to like, if you look in Kenya, you have all these options. Um, you can also see there's a lot of funds that invest in Africa that are not Africa-based. These funds tend to be um, a little bit more on that venture philanthropy impact investing side, whereas the ones headquartered in Africa 
tend to be more your traditional VC players. Okay, before I go into my process of how you reach out to investors, any questions, specific questions um, on what has been talked about before? Megan, there was a question on, uh, can equity be given out over a period of time based on an agreement? Yeah, I think I answered that one. Oh, did you? Okay, I wanted to make sure you got to it, thanks. The, the answer is yes. That's what an option is. Okay. So how can you get in touch with investors? So the first step is to identify likely investors. So again, um, you will have access to these slides. Um, and here is actually a link. So you can get this link. Uh, it's, a, it's a crowdsourced. Um, Google spreadsheet that has, you know, the name of a person, the entity, the type of fund they are, who they've invested in, um, kind of what stage they like to invest in, any other comments, sector focus, have they invested in Africa before, um, how active are they in Africa, what countries in Africa, and where they're located. And so you can start this list that probably has like 200 and some companies investment companies on it, but you might see like, uh, okay, uh, energy access ventures. Let's use them as an example, number 10. So you are a South African e-commerce startup. You look at row 10 and you're like, okay, energy access ventures, probably not going to be uh, investing in me, but let's keep looking. Okay, I'm looking at who they've invested in before. It seems like mostly off-grid electric companies, solar lights, maybe a little agriculture. Okay, then you see when to approach initial customers or traction. Okay, my, my South African e-commerce company um, has customers paying, so that's good. Energy focus, not so good. Sector focus, not good. Um, and they invest in all of Sub-Saharan Africa except South Africa. So that means they're not going to invest in me. Remember what I said about institutional investors having a mandate? Because of the industry and the geographies that they focus on, I'm not a good fit. And it's a waste of everybody's time, your time, and their time um, if you reach out to them. So how you want to use um, this sheet is to actually filter by um, the sector focus, the geographic focus, and when to approach so that you're looking at only investment companies that meet the criteria for your company. Um, the other thing I'd like to look at is activity in Africa and invest in Africa before. Uh, from experience, if that answer is no and the activity in Africa is low, you're, it's highly unlikely that you're the one company they're gonna make that exception for. So we tend to, um, if people reach out to us and say we're interested in investing in Oze and I look on their website and I don't see any African companies, I reach out to them and say, hey, have you invested in Africa before? I don't see anything on your um, website, on your portfolio. And if they say no, I say thank you very much for your time. Please contact me once you do. Because what we found is that being there first is typically uh, a lot of work and, and no outcome. Now, the exception to that is angel investors who may, you know, have, are probably passionate or excited about investing in a frontier market um, and can do whatever they want with their money. So angel investors who haven't invested in Africa before will make an exception for. Oh, and I want to say uh, thank you, Ido Sum, for uh, putting together this list. It's really, really great. Um, so then... You can also find out who invested in what via Crunchbase. I think that's a really good tool because um, you want to, it's, sometimes it's hard to say like, do I fit in their mandate? But you can say, okay, these are like peer companies to me. We're at similar stages. We're in similar industries. We're not directly competitive. Um, and so I want to see who invested in M Pharma because I think somebody who's invested in M Pharma might be interested in investing in me. So that's a different kind of step one than this list. Uh, there's a company called Crunchbase, a website. You can go on Crunchbase. 
you can put in M pharma um, and you can see um, basically everyone who invested in them. So you go back and forth and you say, okay, M pharma has these investors. Then you click on those investors and you see who else they invested in. Then you click on those companies and you see who invested in them. And in that way, it's another way for you to see um, kind of the ecosystem of investors to invest in companies like yours. And then the second step is to make your own database. So you don't want to use that big spreadsheet with um, lots and lots of different companies that will never invest in you. Um, so keep your own uh, database. Google, uh, Google Sheets is a great way to do it because you can share it with your co-founders. Um, and you want to keep some notes. So obviously the fund, the person, their contact information, that's very, very clear. And then you want to figure out how you're connected to them because most investors ignore cold emails. So if I say, oh, um, Emmanuel J is an investor. I don't know him, but I think he'd love my company. I'm just going to guess that his email is emmanuel at emmanuel.com and I'm going to send him an email. If he doesn't know me, he's probably not going to take that email. He's probably not going to meet with me. He's probably not going to invest in my company. So you want to find people you know who know other people, who know your targets, who, so that they can make a warm introduction for you. So I like to, in advance, kind of get all of my connections because we have some people who are like super connectors in your network who maybe know everybody. And so you want to use those people sparingly and save them for either the ones that you're most excited about getting connected to or the ones that are hardest to reach. And then you want to figure out why they'd be interested. That could be they're interested because they've said um, they're interested in investing in more women and you're a female CEO. They might be interested because you saw that they made this investment in company X and you share values with company X. So based on research by reading, you know, tech publications, looking on their website, you want like a two to three sentence description as to why that VC would be interested in investing in your company. You also want to figure out ticket size because if you're raising a million dollar round and they do a minimum of $5 million investments, then you're too small, you're too early, they're not going to invest in you. Um, it also helps with planning if you know okay, I'm trying to raise a million dollars and all these people do a hundred thousand dollar ticket. That means I'm going to need 10 yeses before I can complete this one. And then obviously a place to keep any other notes that you have. So then you want to ask for your intros. So like I said, you're super connectors. You don't want to ask them for like a thousand introductions. Uh, it's not polite. They probably have a really good network because they're really busy people. Um, so the first thing that you want to do is, let's say I think Diana has a connection um, to Jude, and I really want to talk to Jude. I think he's going to invest in my company, and I see on LinkedIn that Diana knows Jude. So I would send an email to Diana saying, hi, Diana, you know, how are you? How is your family? Hope everything's okay. Um, I'm trying to get in contact with Jude because he uh, is a partner at XYZ Investments. Um, XYZ Investments would be interested in my company, Beta, because of their investments in these other companies and because they've said they wanted to increase the number of women in their portfolio. Just to refresh your memory, this is what Beta does. And I'm happy to hop on the phone with you to explain more or take you out to coffee. So you want to, in that email, you, first of all, you know, ask them if they're comfortable making that connection for you. We all have connections on LinkedIn who we truly don't know. And so I probably can't reach out to that person. They won't get back to me just like they won't get back to you. Um, you want to remind them what your company does because if they're in your social circle, they probably kind of know what your company does, but they don't have your talking points that you want to make sure get to the investor. And then you want to tell them why you think that investor is a good match because they're going to pass that on to the investor. Um, you are asking them to spend human capital um, and for human capital can be more valuable than money. And so only ask for an introduction if you are ready to follow through and only ask for an introduction 
if you're a good fit. So if you're looking to raise $25,000 and you want an introduction to a fund that does series D million dollar investments and you ask me for an introduction, I'll likely say, I don't think it's a good fit. So I'm not going to hurt my reputation with this investor by introducing a company that is a waste of time for them to talk to. So like really like, do your research in advance and, and make sure like you're ready and it's a good fit before you ask for an introduction. And then after they've agreed, kind of like wipe away that email chain and start a new email that they can just forward. So a very, very formal email that thanks them for agreeing to introduce, introduce you to Jude that they can then just put, you know, to Jude at Jude.com. Like, I want to know if you're interested in talking with, Diana, she's a really good entrepreneur, and I think that you know you have a lot to talk about. So you're minimizing the amount of work that you're asking somebody else to do on your behalf. And then, of course, like I've said, spread it out. Don't ask one person for dozens of recommendations. Um, so here is an example of an actual email that um, I sent out for Oze um, to be introduced to EWB Ventures. So this is the quote unquote forwardable email that Claire, who I asked to introduce me, just has to send, you know, forward it on. So I wanted to highlight some things. Um, you know, I'm excited to reconnect with EWB. I had met them prior. Um, and I'm particularly excited about their commitment to investing in female-led startups and startups that help women thrive. Um, and then I told, you know, about one of our OZA users who is thriving because of using Oze. Um, then I tell her a little bit about what Oze does and some traction to get them excited. This is obviously a long time ago. Um, and then again, our vision to get them excited. And then the ask, right? We are raising a seed round. It's already 60% committed and would love the opportunity to share a bit more about Oze if Elaine is interested. So very, like Claire and I are friends, we went to college together. When we normally talk, it's not formal like this, but I gave her an email that she could just forward on to somebody. Um, and then follow up. So don't wait for, in this case, Elena to respond and say, like, yeah, I'm really excited to talk to Megan. You know, you immediately follow up and say, thank you for introducing me, reiterate why you think it's a good fit, and then give your availability. Um, because no one wants to play like scheduling bingo. Um, include a pitch deck if you feel so comfortable, like five slides or so to give them more information. Um, and if you don't hear back within two to four weeks, politely follow up. Um, include a new milestone so you're not just saying like, hey, Elena, you said you'd get back to me and you didn't, so I'm still here, thanks. You can say, you know, when we last talked a month ago, we had 750. Uh, daily active users, and we did an event that went really well, and now we've doubled that, and we have 15,000 daily active users, or 1,500 daily active users. That's giving them some new information that maybe if they weren't excited before, they'll be excited now. Um, and then, like, really track it. Um, we use HubSpot, which can be paid, so you don't necessarily have to use it, but you can put Reminders in your Google Calendar, follow up with Elena a month after you send it. You can use Post-its, um, memos, however you need to do it. Keep on track of the status, so who you've sent, who's responded, who's passed. Um, because I think if you're raising money for your company, like half of your job is sending follow-up, just checking in emails. Like you'll be surprised. And there are investors that I like had to politely harassed for like almost a year before they invested in Oze. And they might just be testing you. They might want to see like how committed you are, how good you are at attending to details. And also like, is your startup advancing over the period of time that you're, you're talking with them? Um, and then always after, no matter what happens, um, send a thank you to the person who connected you and tell them the outcome. Do you, like, you could say, like, hi, Claire, thank you so much for connecting me with Elena. We had a really good call last week. I hope that she ends up investing in my company. Um, because you want to maintain that relationship with the connector and not just be using them and not have them wonder, you know, I introduced them, like, whatever happened with that. 
And then once you're ready to actually get the money, um, make sure that you have an online presence. So like your website, depending on what demographic you serve, but your website in Ghana is typically not for your customers. It's for external parties. So your website should be treating investors a lot of times like your customers. Um, link any media or awards that you have um, received because again, what they're looking at when they're looking at your website is like, is this a legitimate company that if I put money into, like I can have confidence that they know how to spend it. Um, and you can use things like Squarespace or Wix to get a professional looking website up even if you can't code. Um, so no one on our tech team built our website. Uh, on LinkedIn, you also want to make sure your profile is complete. Um, even if you have a day job, put yourself as the founder of your startup and make it your current profession. Um, if you have a day job, you can tell investors, I have a day job, but as soon as I raise this round, I'm quitting my day job. They might even make that contingent upon the investment. Um, and then any team member that you have in your deck, in your pitch deck, needs to have on their LinkedIn that they work for your company. Because what we see is like a lot of like tech bros, they'll be in like six or seven different pitch decks and none of them are actually working on any of those companies, but the CEO just needed a coder to put on their deck, right? So you want all of your team members, if they're going to do diligence, they wanna see that all of these people truly do work for your company and are willing to put that out there on their LinkedIn. And then if you're looking to get these kind of large name VCs, um, or especially VCs who are registered outside of Africa, you probably want to register your business in the U.S. Um, international investors are more comfortable with that because they understand the law and they understand the IP. Um, if you're registered um, in the U.S., you can accept payments using Stripe and you get a U.S. bank account so you can keep your revenues in dollars instead of CD or Naira. Um, of course, it, registering in the U.S. isn't for everybody. It, if you know, you have to then comply with U.S. regulations. If you only serve customers in Ghana, you only get paid in cash. It might not be worth it. It costs money and it adds complexity. Um, but if registering in the U.S. is something that you want to do, again, there's a website up here, stripe.com slash atlas, that can, for $500, get you registered in the U.S., give you a U.S. bank account, and allow you to you know, give confidence to your investors by saying you're a U.S. registered company. So that is it in terms of slides. I can take any questions from people that might have them. And if anyone wants to just raise their hand, uh, we can call on you and you can ask your question live as well. Is anybody here raising money right now? You can give the thumbs up uh, with the react button if you are. Let, let's see, there's a question from Selassie here. Selassie, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for this. Um, with your last slide, you made mention of registering your business in the US. Mm -hmm. Is that to say that, um, if you're not registered in the U.S., a possibility of venture uh, of a of an investor investing in your business is not likely to happen because they don't understand the laws that may pertain to your country. So it completely depends on the type of investor that you have. So a wealthy Ghanaian uh, who wants to invest in your business as an angel investor likely doesn't care. Um, and they're happy to invest in Ghana, in CD, in your business. Um, if you are raising from institutional investors, even those inside Africa, they'll probably want you to be registered either in Mauritius or in, in Delaware in the United States. Um, it's good for tax reasons, and th those two, that state and that country, um, are set up to have kind of pro-startup legislation. So if you are looking to raise money from outside, I do think it is really important. Um, how we work in Oze is we're a Ghanaian company uh, registered in Ghana, but our IP, our 
like our app is held by a US company. And when we take investors, whether it's from Ghana or Nigeria, Europe or US, they're investing in our parent company in the US. So they know that they have the protection of the US justice system if something were to happen. And then we just transfer money into our Ghanaian subsidiary that we need for operating. Mm. Okay. Uh, another follow-up question. Um, so how easy will it be for a young startup to be able to register a business in the U.S. and not necessarily have a physical presence in the U.S., but just have a U.S. Uh, business registration license? Yeah, so if you're, you know, an e-commerce company selling anything online or a tech company, anything with that kind of presence, it's very easy on this website, straight.com slash atlas. They want you to register in the U.S. so that you can get a U.S. bank account so that you can use their payment processing system. You can think of them as like a pay stack or a flutter wave, um, that kind of uh, company. Um, and they make it very, very easy. The whole process is online. Um, mm. If you're a small retail shop and you're taking cash, then there's, there's no reason to do this. But if you're looking to attract outside institutional capital, then I do think it's important and it shouldn't be so hard for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and you don't get need a physical presence there. They give you a post office box so that you have an address. Sure, sure. All right. I think we have time for one last question. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah, hello. Yeah, I want, uh, I want, sorry, I want to find out. Yeah, can you hear me, please? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, where you were, were, during your presentation, we were talking, you got to the track, and assuming you are a fresh startup, you are about to, to, to raise capital. And you, you reach to one investor, he's much into your, your tracking. And this is the time you're also setting up, maybe like we, the young ones, you're just setting up, still trying to get your team, which is not yet ready. And you reach an investor, and the investor is much talking about your tracking. How do you defend yourself in, in, in that situation? About your traction. Um, so if I am going to be completely yeah. honest with you, um, Ghanaian investors tend to be fairly risk adverse, just as, you know, there's exceptions to every rule, but as a rule, the investor group in Ghana tends to be very risk adverse, in which case they're unlikely to put money into your company before you have paying customers. Now, if you, if you scope out more broadly and look at Nigeria, if you have a good technology built and you're a technologist, you can get, you know, an investment from a fund like MicroTraction before you have paying customers, if you have a prototype or a proof of concept. If you have a company that's going to take a lot of R&D, like you need a lot of investment before you can have a paying customer, then I would recommend that you look at global accelerator programs so that you can get your company in front of more global capital. Because in Silicon Valley in the US, they'll put money, a million dollars in a startup before you even have a customer. But if you're raising money locally, have your team in place and have some traction, have some revenue before you try to raise money. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm comfortable. I see a question. Hi, Megan, I have a shoe business and make an average of 25,000 CDs a month for the past eight months. I'm interested in raising funds. Should I focus on a bank or an angel investor for funds? Should I keep my registration as a sole proprietor and upgrade to an LLB? So, I think that if you can get access to affordable debt at a reasonable interest rate, you should go to a bank and get debt funding. Why is that? Because with debt funding, you're not giving away any ownership of your company. So you take the money in, you use the money, you pay back the money, and you still own 100% of your company. People who are going to angel investors are people who actually don't have predictable enough revenue to raise debt. And so they're saying, you know, I'm a riskier bet. I'm not sure I can pay you back, but give me some money and I'll give you some ownership of my company. 
So I would say if you can raise debt, then you should absolutely raise debt. Um, and if you use Oze um, for at least three months, then we can actually help you get a no collateral bank loan. Um, in which case, I think being a sole proprietor in LLB, you're probably not going to attract an angel investor unless you have a very strong social mission as a sole proprietor, but I don't think that should be an issue with the bank. A question, with a registered business in the U.S., does that increase your production costs since you will be paying taxes in both countries? So yes, I would say only register in the US if you're trying to, if you're a tech company, an e-commerce company, you're processing lots of payments, you wanna keep those payments in dollars um, and you're trying to attract foreign investors. The example here of, of the shoe shop that makes 25,000 CDs, 2,500 CDs a month, um, there, I don't, you should stay registered in Ghana. There's no reason to become an international company. But if you want, you know, if you're trying to raise hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars, that kind of money for, and you want to, you know, spend from Ghana to Nigeria to Cote d'Ivoire, then you're looking at the type of company that probably the cost of having the dual registration uh, is much smaller than the benefits of having it. Okay. Um. I see a message. Please try to get the Ozai app on the Apple phone for us. It's coming. I think we're like a month away from that being ready. I am also an iPhone user. I can't wait. Um, so uh, what somebody says, a mobile app prototype ready, need funds for promotions and operations. Any investors you can personally recommend for such a venture? Um, so it's hard to say without knowing kind of what industry you're in, what stage you're in, what your ambitions are. But I would say that if you have a mobile app, um, you should have it out and have people testing it so that you can come back to investors and say, you know, this is how many people used it. This is our retention rate. This is what percent paid for it. Even if you're only distributing it to 100 people to keep your cost really low. And then depending on the industry, you can look at any of the typical technology investors. Is there a guarantee that when you register your business in the US, you can raise funding? No. Um, yeah, that's the short answer. Um, you can wait and you know start having conversations you know, with American investors and then say, you know, if you decide to invest in us, then we will register in the US. So it costs $500, which is like 25,000 CDs. So you, yeah, 2,500 CDs. So you might want to wait and say, okay, like we are willing to do this registration if you invest in us, but wait until you have someone committed before you do that. And that I would say like look in Nigeria before you look in the US um, because there's a lot of great early stage investors in Nigeria. Be a little bit careful with valuation because they know that capital is more scarce in West Africa. And so they might try to give you less startup friendly terms on the investment putting in. Um, but, you know, they're like raising in the US, there's a lot of bias. I'm sure you're all aware um, that most venture capital from the US goes to white men. Um, so it isn't gonna be easy to raise from the US, but if you have really good traction or you get into a global accelerator, it is possible. Okay, so I think that is it. I know we have three more sessions um, with the SB Incubator coming up. I will be talking about financial metrics later this week. Um, so feel free to join those sessions um, and come with any questions that you might have. And then of course, you're always welcome to download and use the Oze app where you have on-demand access to Oze business coaches. So whenever these questions arise, um, you can ask us for that kind of support. Uh, we're here for you uh, and your businesses. <laughs> what, what, the last question is, what do you think about Ghanaian startups with very high valuations without revenue? Um, you maybe are setting yourself up for long-term defeat uh, because there is pressure at each round to raise at a higher valuation. And if right. the revenue doesn't follow, um, then you're going to have what's called a down round, which is a very negative signal to investors.
Um, so don't be too greedy with your valuation. Make sure it's something fair and something you can back with numbers when you are going to investors and the lead investors who will actually end up setting that. So you're negotiating with the lead investor. And then once you agree on terms, you say to the other investors, these are the terms you want in or out. Um, Dave, anything you want to say in closing or Prince? Uh, no, that was, that was wonderful, Megan. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the Stambic Incubator team. Uh, we're excited to do the rest of the sessions. Uh, there's one on Thursday at the same time, and then next week on Tuesday and Thursday at the same time again. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to make sure they've registered for all of those. Uh, some exciting topics coming up. And um, with that, I'll pass it over to the Stanbic Incubator team. Uh, I don't know if Foster or Barbara, are you on and want to say uh, any closing words? Hi, I'm here. I'm finally here. Um, I think it was a great session. I actually learned a lot. Uh, thank you, all, everyone, for making time to join today's session. This is the third part of the webinar series we've been hosting for the last two months. Uh, the first one was on legal matters. The second one was on customer experience. Um, this is on financial literacy, and the next one would be on uh, human capital or human resource management. Uh, and so, the focus of this webinar series is so we can help address peculiar problems within most SMEs and startups uh, that are trying to grow and may not have the opportunity to be in accelerator and incubator programs. These capacity building sessions, we hope, would be a way to. Uh, give you an introductory uh, uh, experience or understanding to some of these subjects so that reading further you get context to what uh, you are coming across in your researches. So thank you Megan, uh, I, I really enjoyed this session. I've screenshotted a lot of the, the slides even though I know you'll be sharing them and I look forward to seeing everyone on Thursday the recorded sessions on e of each of each uh, webinar series is posted on our SoundCloud uh, page. You can go to soundcloud.com and search for SB Incubator Ghana, or you can basically search soundcloud.com slash SB Incubator hyphen Ghana, and you will see recordings of our previous webinars and, and this particular series will also be uploaded there. So thank you all and do see you on Thursday. Thank you very much. All right, we'll close Great. for today. Thanks. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.